This is Phil Koopman, and I'll be talking about an automated vehicle safety update for early 2021. In this talk, I'll first cover where is the industry in general as of early 2021. Then I'll talk about going beyond the SAE levels, and in particular, the role of humans versus technology in describing how self-driving cars work. Then I'll talk about industry trends for 2021, including the role of standards, some technical challenges, and some organizational challenges. Let's begin by binning up the different types of automated vehicles that are out there on the road driving around today or are planned to be on the road soon. The first is low-speed shuttles. Low-speed shuttles typically carry up to 15 passengers. They run a fixed route like a bus uh, at perhaps 5 or 10 miles per hour. O often they can go up to 25, but they usually operate more slowly than that. And there have been demonstrations in cities around the world. The safety approach for these shuttles is generally based on an argument that they go very slow, therefore they have limited kinetic energy and they can only do limited damage. There's often a non-driver safety conductor, so there's a person assigned to be in the shuttle and help load and unload passengers and ensure safety, but many times they do not have access to controls while the shuttle is operating. There have been a number of mishaps with these shuttles. Uh, one that got a lot of press was a shuttle hit by a backing truck. This shuttle was designed to stop when something got too near, so its way of being safe is to come to a stop when it might have an issue. Uh, but in this case, it stopped right behind the truck. The truck driver assumed the shuttle was going to move out of the way and hit the shuttle at low speed. The conductor inside the shuttle did not have access to controls and tried to make noise and otherwise draw the attention of the truck driver, but that failed, and the truck driver realized something was wrong when he made contact with the shuttle. Fortunately, no one was hurt in that incident. There have been a number of false alarm stops throwing people around the interior. Uh, more recently, the pictures of these shuttles show seat belts, and hopefully the conductor is having people buckle up. Another type of automated vehicle does parcel delivery. Either these are small parcels to stores or to houses to retail customers. The idea here is short range, so-called last mile delivery. And there are a variety of vehicles, some of which operate on roads just like cars. Some are restricted to bike lanes, so they're a bit smaller. And some of them are even smaller and they run on sidewalks. There have been demonstrations in several different cities concentrating on parcel delivery, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic when lots of people want to do online shopping and get delivery to their home. The safety approach initially is that there's a trailing vehicle keeping an eye on things or a trailing person walking depending on the size and configuration of the delivery robot. Later, the industry plans to have remote monitoring of one person monitoring a number of bots and just helping them when they get into trouble. For many of these bots, there's an implicit safety argument that it's small, it doesn't have much energy, doesn't have much mass, and therefore can do limited damage. However, the bigger bots are basically a small car and therefore have more potential safety issues if they hit something. There have been some incidents with sidewalk bots uh, really irritating city dwellers. In one case, a sidewalk bot blocked a wheelchair ramp, so it parked itself on a wheelchair ramp waiting for the light to turn, but there was a wheelchair user in the intersection who was trapped in the intersection when the light changed. A third type of vehicle involves driver-monitored automation. In some cases, these are cars, in some cases they're trucks, but in every case the idea is that there's automation to take care of the mundane driving tasks, but there's continuous driver supervision and the driver, the human driver, is responsible for safety. These vehicles are already in production and out on the roads. The safety approach is it's up to the human to monitor and it's up to the human to maintain safety. There have been a number of mishaps, including extensive press coverage of multiple fatalities involving Tesla crashes. The findings of investigations have been that driver complacency is a real issue. In many cases, the drivers were not paying attention as they're supposed to when supervising automation. And also incidents that happen very quickly. In some cases, it's less than 10 seconds between everything being okay and the fatality occurring, which indicates that the driver can't simply check in every once in a while, but really does need to pay continuous attention to what's happening on the road. Also, in Tempe, Arizona, there was a fatality involved in testing a more capable vehicle, but during tests, the driver was responsible for safety. 
So in operation, it was effectively a driver-monitored automation system. The last type of vehicle is fully autonomous operation. These are currently fleet vehicles with Waymo RoboTaxis, an example that's out there deployed at limited scale in operation. There's also significant interest in middle mile trucks. So those are heavy trucks that go from depot to depot, typically on interstate highways or the equivalent. And that gained a lot of interest in 2020 to beef up the logistics supply chains. The safety approach early on, is there's a human safety driver. So in fact, the human is responsible for safety, but the hope is that as the technology matures, that the driver can be removed, which Waymo has done at this point, and there's a human on call for help, but the car is supposed to know to ask for help. It should not, in the end, be a case where a human is always continuously watching to make sure nothing goes wrong. California has reported a number of incidents, typically low severity, uh, typically, the higher severity ones are blamed on other drivers, and many of the low severity incidents are that the automated vehicle gets rear-ended by another human driver. For a number of years, the industry has, to all appearances, been engaged in a race to get to full autonomy. To their credit, there are some players who say, no, it's not a race. We have to do this right. We have to be safe, and when it's ready, it's ready. But there's plenty of press and rhetoric indicating at least some players are treating this as a race to get their systems deployed. It takes huge resources to succeed, billions or probably tens of billions of dollars to get something like a robo-taxi out on the road. The trend in 2020 was to see more original equipment manufacturers, OEMs, teaming with automated driving system, ADS suppliers, to create various alliances to bring this technology to market. The smaller players have failed or teamed or been acquired over time. There are still some small players out there, but I expect over time you're going to see more failures or teams or acquisitions. The fully autonomous typed vehicles have pivoted hard towards freight, typically towards middle mile trucks or last mile delivery systems in the last year. For last mile service, the argument is it's low kinetic energy, it's small, it's lightweight, and especially if it operates at low speed and has no passengers, that can relax some of the safety considerations, although pedestrian safety is for sure still a potential issue. The middle mile trucks have a path that makes things a little easier than the general case because they're operating on divided highways that are substantially less chaotic than what you would see in an urban center for a robotaxi type application. We've also recently seen a shift or a maturation of so-called SE Level 3 vehicles. These are vehicles where the vehicle does all the driving, but the driver still has some responsibilities for some aspects of safety. Some companies, especially when they announce their first Level 3 vehicle, make a design in which the driver has significant safety responsibility. But over time, they generally come to realize that the handover paradigm has some issues. They may say, all right, the human driver has to be ready and we'll give them 10 seconds to take over. But then what they find out is not all humans can regain situational awareness and take over in 10 seconds. That's a big ask. And they also realize there are some situations in which you can't give the driver 10 seconds because things are happening too quickly. What you see over time is initially from a company, level three means the driver has to be able to take over when notified. But over time, you see that even if the driver does not take over, the vehicle will do something reasonable like bring itself to an in-lane stop. And I'll call that level three plus because that goes beyond the requirements of the ASA standard. This means that it's important when somebody says they have a level three vehicle to ask what they really mean by that. In particular, ask what happens when the driver does not honor a takeover request and whether the car still remains safe even if that happens. The complexity of what a level three vehicle really means points out a potential issue with the SAE levels from zero through five about automation. And the issue is that it isn't always clear to the driver or the general public exactly who's responsible for what. In this slide, I'm going to propose a different classification that is more user-centric and covers things that the user cares about, like what's the user responsibility, what's the human driver responsibility, and from that follows who's in charge and where is the liability and blame likely to fall if there's an issue. This classification divides up into four different operational modes. The first one is assistive. And in assistive, the driver role is driving. So this is a normal vehicle with assistive technology, maybe anti-lock brakes, maybe automatic emergency braking. 
but the driver drives all the time, the driver's in charge of driving safety, and the driver's in charge of other safety. The second out of four modes is supervised. In supervised mode, the driver has eyes on the road, but is not continuously controlling the car. The car is performing the driving function, but the human driver is in charge of driving safety, as well as other safety. An example of this might be current Teslas that have the so-called autopilot or General Motors Super Cruise, in which the vehicle does all the driving, but the human driver is expected to pay continuous attention and intervene if required for safety, whether or not notified by the system that there's a problem. The next operating mode is automated. In automated mode, the driver can take eyes off the road. That's because the car is in charge of both driving and driving safety. The human driver cannot be blamed for a mistake made in driving because it is entirely the car's job to drive safely. There is some other safety, though, that the human is responsible for. That doesn't have to do directly with driving, but other vehicle safety things, such as, for example, whether or not the child in the child seat is properly buckled, or what happens if there's a problem with a vehicle, such as a battery fire, to make sure everyone gets out of the car, or who handles responsibilities after there's been a crash. It's possible the automated vehicle will do some of these, but ultimately, things other than driving safety getting done properly is the responsibility of the human driver or other responsible adult in the vehicle. The last operating mode is autonomous. In autonomous, there is no human driver. There is no human on-site or even continuously remotely monitoring what's going on. The car drives, the car is responsible for driving safety, and the car is responsible for all other aspects of safety. An advantage to these four operating modes as a classification is that in each mode, it is completely clear who's in charge, who's responsible, and what roles and responsibilities the human driver is assigned. Another trend in the past year has been an emergence of standards that support a standards-based engineering approach. I'll go over different types of standards that are representative, although there are other standards beyond these as well. For vehicle safety, Federal Motor Vehicle Safety Standards have been around for a long time, and also NCAP, which is a test program. They cover basic vehicle functions. They apply to normal vehicles that have no automation at all. They will have to change a bit that if somebody wants to build a vehicle without a steering wheel, there may need to be some changes in either interpretation or implementation of FMVSS. But in general, this is a fairly mature area. Beyond that, there'll need to be a cybersecurity standard, although that's not the emphasis of this talk. Beyond basic vehicle functionality, ISO 26262 provides functional safety coverage, especially for computer-based systems. This applies not only to current vehicles with electronics, but applies to the electronics inside automated vehicles. Within the context of the driving function, ISO 21448 and ISO TR4804 specifically cover things such as issues with the environment, the fact that sensors aren't perfect, and dealing with edge cases as you create automation. Beyond driving safety, UL4600 addresses system-level safety for the entire vehicle, including non-driving functions, and is designed to work in concert with the other standards shown here. Beyond providing a scope for consideration of system safety, UL4600 also shows how to make a highly automated vehicle safety case to make sure that nothing was left out that's relevant to safety when applying the other standards. There are a number of technical safety challenges that I expect to be prominent in 2021. The first is perception and prediction. We've known for a long time that it's difficult to build a life-critical system that depends critically upon machine learning-based functions, especially for perception. That remains an open challenge. But another challenge that has become more obvious in the last year or so is that we probably need more than object motion tracking. You may have a system and say, well, I'm not too worried about the perception being imperfect because I know something is there and I'm going to track its motion and make sure that I don't hit it based on extrapolation of the trajectory. That works in many cases. It's especially good for most vehicle situations, but it may not work for other objects that can change the motion suddenly. As an example, here's a deer standing at the side of the road. It's perfectly still, 
but an experienced rural driver knows that what happens next is the deer stays still until the last possible second and then runs in front of your car. Therefore, object classification saying, oh, that's a deer, is important, and the response is not to come to an immediate stop, but to slow down as you pass the deer to give yourself more time so that when it suddenly changes motion, you can avoid a crash or at least mitigate the damage done by the crash. Another technical challenge will be safety of the intended function. In general, this is a drive-fix-drive drive iteration process. You drive, you find some problems, you fix them, you drive some more. The industry has been, in various ways, doing this over time, but the newly issued 21448 standard makes it possible to do that with a little more rigor in a standards-based way. As an example, Waymo says that they have 6 million test miles and 65,000 deployed miles. If you have a small fleet, you can do this. You can brute force safety simply by driving around a lot and claiming that it's unlikely you'll f hit something you haven't seen before if you have a 100 to 1 difference between testing and driving. However, that doesn't scale very well. As you have larger fleets, you need an argument that works even if your testing is not 100 times more than your deployed miles. I think likely this will involve UL4600 concepts and safety cases. Uh, people can say, yes, we'll do this in simulation, but then you have to argue somehow that the simulation is representative of the real world, and so it's a little more subtle than brute force. You have to make sure that good engineering is involved, and in general, the argument is valid that the simulator really does predict what will happen in the real world. Getting from works okay to safe is the hard part. The first few nines, so 99%, 99.9%, you can brute force them, you can drive a lot of miles, you can say, well, at 99.9%, .9 I have so much data feeding into my simulator, I'm sure nothing's missing, that will happen that often. But once you get out to seven or eight nines, 99.9, .9, lots of nines, then you have the issue that things will happen that you've never seen before, and you've never seen them, you never trained your machine learning on them, and you have not put them in your simulated test. That's going to be the challenge trying to scale up these fleets. I think that the way to deal with that is to use field feedback into safety cases, which I'll go into momentarily. Ultimately, for full automation to be successful, you need to develop trust in it. All the stakeholders need to have trust, especially the public. But you can't prove you're perfect because you operate in an open world. There will always be unknowns. And even if there weren't any unknowns and you got it perfect, the world will change tomorrow. Something different will happen tomorrow that has never happened before. The industry says they intend to achieve positive risk balance, which means safer than a human driver. It might need to be some multiple safer than a human driver. But in general, the argument is that if an automated vehicle is safer than a human driver, then it should be OK. But there's no human driver responsible in the autonomous or automated vehicles for the driving safety. And that leads to an issue of, yes, the manufacturer says it's safe, but do the other stakeholders really trust that that's the case? I advocate using a positive trust balance approach. And the idea is you need more than brute force testing to get the public to believe that you're really safe. I think you need engineering rigor, build it right, validation, test it right. You need to have field feedback, improve it right, and you need to have good safety culture, live it right. And in this talk, I want to concentrate on the field feedback because I think that's the difference between being able to deploy at scale successfully and having a great demo based on brute force testing that is hard to scale. Field feedback is an essential component to UL4600, and the idea is to tie the field feedback into the safety case. Let me take a moment to briefly explain what I mean by safety case. A safety case consists of a claim, which is a property of the system, such as my system is safe or my system avoids hitting pedestrians. It's an argument about why this is true, because, for example, I detect and maneuver to avoid pedestrians. And there's evidence to support the argument, tests, analysis, simulations, and so on. Underneath the safety case are sub-arguments and sub-claims and so on. So for example, you may say, I detect pedestrians, and here's my evidence, I detect pedestrians. And I maneuver around detected pedestrians, and here's my evidence I do that. And I stop if I can't maneuver, and here's my evidence for that, to wrap up to this is why you should believe that I'm not going to hit pedestrians. In more simple terms, a safety case says, here's what safe means, here's why I think I'm safe, and here's the evidence so that you should believe me when I make that claim. 
Safety cases are great in the abstract, but the issue is if you have a safety case and you have a vehicle, how do you know that the vehicle actually matches the safety case? How do you know that the safety case will actually predict safety operationally? To do this, UL4600 says to use Safety Performance Indicators, SPIs, SPIs. Here's a sample simplistic safety case where I'm just showing the claims, not the argument. The top level claim is that the vehicle is acceptably safe. And one of the reasons you think it's safe is it avoids crashes. And one of the reasons it avoids crashes is it detects objects. And it detects objects because the sensors are effective and the data fusion is effective. And there's even all the way down to support and maintenance that the sensors are effective because they're cleaned regularly or they're kept clean somehow and they work properly and so on. Test coverage has to be in here. Software quality has to be in here. In other words, the safety case is all the reasons that you think it's safe, encompassing all the aspects that are required for safety. The way spies fit in is that spies monitor the validity of safety case claims. The vehicle is safe, avoids crashes. Well, those are sort of the obvious things to measure. But you don't have that data until after you deploy. So how do you know that it's responsibly safe to deploy before you've actually done it? Sure, you can do testing and so on, but you won't get enough miles to really have statistical validity that you're as safe as you need to be with enough nines. What you can do is you can attach spies to lower levels of the safety case. And the idea is that if your object detection isn't as good as you thought it was, then you're unlikely to be as safe as you think you are. The idea here is that the leading indicators, things you can measure before you deploy, are down at the bottom to make sure you have all the bases covered, to make sure all your components are working the way you think they work. And that is hopefully predictive of what will happen with the lagging metrics, the things that happen after you deploy. The idea of using spies is to connect a measurement to every claim that you can figure out how to measure so that if the safety case is invalid, you'll know it because a measurement will say, well, this isn't as good as you thought it was well before you deploy or even after you deploy to continuously monitor that if something changes in the world that invalidates your safety case, you'll know about it before you get a loss event. Some examples of spies, the obvious ones are acts dangerously, but that's only one piece of spies. Sure, getting too close to pedestrians is an issue. Tailgating another vehicle is clearly an issue. But you'll only know about those happening after you deploy if they're really rare events that are not seen in testing. The components also have spies they can meet. You can have false negative and false positive detection rates. Your safety argument is built on some sort of claim about how good your sensors are and how good your perception is. And if your perception is not as good as you think it is, then probably you're not as safe as you think you are. Correlated multi-sensor failure rates are going to be a sticking point here because the assumption if you have three sensors, at least one will see something might be violated in some rare cases, but often enough to be a problem. If, however, you have spies on each type of sensor, you can do things like, say, in this picture, there's a system which did not see the child next to the parent. If you wait for lagging metrics, that may not be good enough because the lagging metric is, did you almost hit a kid but you stopped in time? You don't really want to wait for that to happen to realize you're never seeing a kid next to an adult. So the spies down at the lower level that get into more granularity about system performance are going to help here they're going to tell you have a problem before you get a near hit incident. If your sensors are getting dirty and they're not getting cleaned, then you need to know that before the dirty sensor causes a mishap. The idea of a spy is if it's relevant to safety, it should be in the safety case. And if it's a claim in the safety case, if at all possible, you should be measuring it with a spy. For 2021, I expect to see a number of themes in industry. The first is a move towards more elements of positive trust balance. Right now, the industry is all about the testing, all about the road testing, all about the bug fixing and doing some more testing. And that runs out of steam at some point. You can only get 99 point a few nines this way. Brute force only goes so far. In order to really deploy something that's both safe and that people trust, you're going to need engineering rigor as well as the validation, and you're going to need feedback, and you're going to need a strong safety culture. I think there'll be a move to standards-driven safety now that the standards are available. And I think there'll be a need for increased transparency to gain public trust in this technology as it deploys. I think safety performance indicators are a key part of this so that you can drive continual improvement and updates. And you can base the improvement on data that you can collect before there's an incident or a loss event. 
That means field feedback both during the test phase but also after deployment. A theme in 2021 is as these vehicles get closer to deploying, people are going to start paying more attention to scalability past the pilot vehicles. Accurate perception and prediction is still a work in progress. If you didn't like the DR example before, consider this person. In this particular picture, the person is not classified as a person. The vehicle knows there's something there. It sees the trash can. It sees the light pole, but didn't actually quite notice the person. But even if it did, it needs to predict whether that currently stationary person is going to start moving and jump into the road in front of the vehicle. It's unreasonable to expect it to be perfect, but a normal human driver makes this decision every time they go through the intersection, and the vehicle needs to be at least that good to be as safe as a human driver. I expect we'll see a transition from brute force data to safety case approaches so that they can argue things like, yes, here's why you should believe that we'll behave responsibly around pedestrian crossings. 2021 will see an increase in the importance of organizational safety challenges. There's truly significant pressure to deploy. At the end of 2020, we saw a flurry of empty driver seat demo videos. Some of those companies said that they were completely safe and ready to deploy. Some of the companies may have been under pressure to meet an end of year date, uh, but it's hard to really know, and so that's a transparency issue. The question is, can the teams take the time they need to really get safe, or will they be driven by calendar deadlines? There's some industry transparency needed. It's really important that when a company puts its vehicle on the road, they're doing it because it's the safe thing to do, not because it's a certain date, but also that the public trusts that, yes, they're really doing it because it's safe. I think, in part, this is going to require more collaboration and transparency rather than competition when it comes to the safety aspects of things. And it will be really important to build up a bank of public trust. Eventually, there will be an adverse news event. Driving is not perfectly safe. And it's really important for the industry to have the public's trust so that when an adverse news event eventually comes, they can weather the storm with the public believing based on transparency rather than just assertions that, yes, all the companies in the space are doing the right thing to make sure this technology is safe. A challenge in 2021 that companies need to address is ensuring they actually have a robust safety culture because safe outcomes won't happen unless their safety culture is in order. Three things are coming together that make this a particular challenge. First, you have the Silicon Valley move fast and break things culture, which is not accustomed to doing safety critical design. That's meeting up with the automotive safety culture, which is accustomed to doing safety critical design, but also historically has put a significant workload on the human driver to not only act safely, but also compensate for technical defects to maintain safety, even though something's gone wrong except now there's no human driver. The entire industry needs to come together to have a good, robust safety culture, not only within individual companies, but across the industry, so that the stakeholders can trust and accept this important technology.